If we can move to the first slide about, uh, let's say, what exists at the international level. So I heard earlier from, from Dorothée that um, um, not all of you are maybe completely familiar with the mandate of the ILO. Mm -hmm. um, the ILO has been existing for over 100 years. Yeah. So basically, the, the ILO is our common kind of UN agency that sets standards mm -hmm. in the world of work. Um, and some of these standards are generic, apply everywhere. And some of these standards are specific to some sectors. Now, what's interesting is that uh, recently, um, in 2006 and 2007, several new standards have appeared. I, I've put you a lot of material on this slide, and um, but I, I don't want to be too long about it. Basically, it's important for you to know that um, international standards that apply to fishing exist. On the top right, you can see there's ratifications of C-188. That stands for Convention Number 188. Oh. And the reason why I put uh, uh, just below it ratification of MLC, that's the Maritime Labor Convention, is that when we try to regulate the world of work, uh, we don't look at everyone who's at sea the same way. And so especially from the perspective of the ILO, there had there has historically been a little bit of a, of a difference between fishermen uh, fishers and other people who work at sea, which we might call, for example, seafarers who work uh, uh, maybe on cruise ships or in shipping or other types of, uh, of uh, uh, maritime activities. Uh, what's interesting when you look into detail is also to see whether there is uh, international um, interest and speed in uh, uh, ratifying those instruments. Um, if you look a little bit uh, at how we develop international standards, basically countries and in the case of the ILO, other constituents like trade unions and employers organizations gather every year in Geneva. The next gathering is happening in just a month's time in June. And they try to agree on the standards as we call them. So what is the um, what is the rules that should apply in any type of industry? And uh, the fact that a new convention is adopted by the International Labor Conference, so by all of these delegates that are in Geneva in June, doesn't necessarily mean that these international documents uh, enter into force or apply everywhere. Uh, this is where the ratification process comes into play. And what we're seeing with phishing, and I've, I've taken the example of Convention 188, but it could apply to other uh, existing instruments, is that historically, ratification of phishing um, instruments has been quite slow. Uh, so you have two instruments here, one developed in 2006, the other one in 2007 one on seafarers, the other one on fishers. And you can see that 15 or almost 20 years later, one has massive ratification, 102 ratifications, and another one has just 21. Um, now, I won't go into too much uh, speculation about what, 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 why that is the case, uh, but I just invite you to, to consider this uh, reality. Uh, uh, apart from, so, uh, the ILO convention, maybe Alex and Alison will touch on it a little bit later, or if you're interested, you can look into it. Uh, basically, it tries to go a little bit um, further in identifying some of the um, main criteria of what work on board a fishing vessel should look like. It does talk, talk a little bit about the role that port states can play when flag states um, basically are not uh, uh, acting and when, for example, port state authorities um, have uh, um, uh, credible um, information that there might be labor abuse on board a fishing vessel that is stopping by in their port. So uh, it's it's trying to uh, move forward uh, the uh, concrete practices on the ground that can be done to make sure that uh, working conditions on board fishing vessels are 
uh, respect uh, human rights. Um, and also it includes a lot of other recommendations about uh, occupational safety and health and other aspects that are important in the context of uh, the ILO. Uh, on the left side, uh, you'll see that um, there have been efforts to try to make sure that important uh, fishing uh, countries, especially from, from the perspective of um, the countries of origin of fishers, um, uh, ratify this instrument. And so here you have in 2019, Thailand, which is a country that has been under quite a lot of scrutiny recently with regards to working conditions in the, in the seafood and, and in the fishing sector. Uh, ratifying. And here again, I think from a business perspective, it's interesting to look at this uh, uh, when there, when you have stories like the one you saw from Ian Urbina or others, that can have a dramatic impact on the economic business side of, of fishing. And so um, obviously, ILO and other actors can kind of play on this situation to try and, and push uh, different countries uh, to ratify these instruments to um, uh, try to have a better playing field. Um, on the bottom right, um, you see that it talks about another instrument. Um, uh, the um, um, actors in, in fishing often talk about uh, um, the um, um, sustainable fishing uh, um, existing um, uh, agreements and recommendations which come from different organizations. You have some which come from the International Maritime Organization. Uh, you, you have some which come from the Food and Agriculture Organization. And then uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Convention Number 188 on Work in Fishing. Um, so um, have a look a little bit about this existing legal framework. This is our our global framework on a very complex issue, because as you can imagine, um, uh, fishing, as, as Dorothée said earlier, can happen in international waters and uh, fish maybe moves around. Uh, we don't find the same species everywhere. We don't have the same needs everywhere as well. This is where we have a second level of actors. So you have international organizations like the ILO, the International Maritime Organization or the FAO, which are developing standards, some which factor in the human dimension of fishing, some which are more geared at what we call IUU fishing, illegal, unregulated, unreported, uh, underreported fishing. So um, illegal fishing activities, uh, um, irrespective of how fishermen are treated on board the fishing vessel, but activities which do not respect, for example, management or conservation efforts. But Aside from this international forum, a lot of the negotiation and the management of fish happens at the regional level. And when I say the regional level, it's all of the little acronyms that you see on this map, on this global map. Um, um, some of them um, here in, in uh, pink, you might see in the Indian Ocean, uh, IOTC. This stands for the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. So the IOTC will bring together all of the stakeholders, which might be the states that are neighboring the Indian Ocean, but it might also be the states that have active fishing in the Indian Ocean to try and develop um, uh, uh, a shared management strategy, in this case, of a specific uh, uh, species breed of fish, in this case, tuna. You have the same thing with ICAT, which is the conservation of Atlantic tuna. So some of these regional management organizations look at management of fisheries through a species perspective, and they only deal with one species. Um, and in particular, maybe species that have a, a particular relevance uh, in the global market. You have other regional fisheries organization uh, like FCWC here, which is in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, this stands for the Fisheries Committee for uh, uh, the West Central Gulf of Guinea. Uh, so countries like Ghana or Nigeria or Ivory Coast, which are uh, around the Gulf of Guinea. 
And in this case, discussions that will happen in FCWC look to manage all types of fish and really focus only on uh, conservation management efforts uh, in that specific region. Now, the very same way that um, standards of, for example, the ILO on uh, fishing are fairly recent when you come to think of it, less than 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the interest of regional fisheries organization for working conditions of fishers has been quite recent. Um, and uh, Alex and Alison can maybe elaborate a little bit more on this, but will be very uneven from regional fisheries management organization uh, from, from one another. So I've put you this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, news from the FCWC website recently within the framework of the project that the Rote was uh, has mentioned earlier uh, that Alex and Alison uh, have been working on. Um, the ILO has initiated uh, collaborations, um, in this case, a memorandum of understanding with regional fisheries management organization. Um, so this is, uh, this is quite important. Also, because when you go back to a business perspective, I remember working with some of my students in, in, in the business school where I teach in Paris, we were looking at a listed sushi company and on their website, we found out that they were documenting very precisely where every type of fish that they were selling in their restaurants was coming from. So if you're working in a human rights or in a sustainability department within that group, what you can do is you, if you're familiar a little bit with uh, fisheries management is you can try to make sure that your sourcing practices maybe come from uh, fisheries that are managed with some sensitivity uh, to human rights and labor rights of fishers. Um, so if you go to the website of WCPFC in the Pacific or FCWC uh, or any other type of uh, RFMO, as we call it, Regional Fisheries Management Organization, you'll be able to see quite quickly whether they're doing anything or not on, on labor rights or human rights. Uh, the last element I wanted to, to raise your attention on is also what can be done at the national level. So we started with the international community and the role that UN agencies or specialized agencies can have to set standards. We've also seen that these standards, um, even if they exist, don't necessarily apply. We've looked at the regional aspect and how regional management happens, you can imagine that it's very tough because when you're trying to manage resources in a space as vast as the Indian Ocean, you have a lot of interests involved and not everyone wants to go in the same direction. Um, if you look, for example, uh, recently at debates around deep sea trawling or about fishing in protected maritime areas, you will find that all countries don't necessarily have the same position on this. And, um, and so it can create quite a lot of difficulties to find common management solutions, especially ones that factor in the human uh, dimension. Um, at the national level, uh, countries can do things as well. Uh, one interesting example, in my opinion, is, is the United States. Um, because it's a very big market to start with, but also because what I'm showing you, um, I would say has inspired other actors, especially within the G7 uh, and the G20. So what you're looking at, uh, this is a screenshot from the website of the US Customs and Border Protection Agency. So it's part of the um, uh, Office of Trade of the United States. And the United States has had for quite some time, since the 1930s, a section in its Tariff Act, um, which is called Section 307, and which basically uh, gives authority to these Customs and Border Protection Authority to place what we called withhold release orders uh, to basically ban the entry into the United States 
and especially into the U.S. market of any good that has been produced with forced labor. Um, and what you can see on this map is that you have some bans that are country specific. In Nepal, for example, this is about uh, a carpet uh, manufacturer that is banned from bringing his carpets into the United States because there is some uh, uh, assumption that there is forced labor or child labor involved. But you will see here that there is also fishing vessel market. And so basically the US for several years now, but as you will see here, this is quite recent and it's been gaining traction in the past couple of years, has been basically forbidding the entry into the US territory of fish that is being caught by specific fishing vessels. Um, if you're interested in this and you want to learn more about how this works, I've put you a very nice resource, which is called Importing Freedom, which presents very simply how this uh, Tariff Act works. Um, it's very connected to seafood. It has been existing, as I said, since the 1930s. It wasn't really efficient until 2016. And what brought back the US to bring attention to this was a scandal in, in uh, Southeast Asia uh, fishing and seafood production. So this resonates a lot with today's class. And the second reason, and I'll conclude with this, why it's highly relevant in our more European context is because the European Union is currently considering setting up a similar import ban. Uh, last week, we were with Dorothée uh, doing a conversation with a member of the European Parliament who was saying that basically, uh, because the US has this ban and the Europe doesn't, well, basically we can become a little bit um, uh, the market for goods that are banned from entering into the US. Mm -hmm. So at the G7 and G20 level, there have been discussions to say, the US has been saying to Canada, to Mexico, if we have NAFTA and goods can enter the US through Mexico and Canada, you need to apply the same rules than, than we are doing. Um, just to conclude from a business perspective, what this means is that um, if, if going back to what Dorothée was saying, if you work for L'Oréal and you manage a highly lucrative uh, uh, business product for L'Oréal, which has a strong component, which is made out of fish, and media reports or civil society actions demonstrate that there is forced labor in production of that, of that fish, you run the risk in the future of seeing all of your production being banned from entering very, very important markets such as European Union or the United States. Um, this, we hope this type of import bans, and I mentioned on the slide, mandatory human rights due diligence, which is a little bit the counterpart, uh, hopefully will have a very strong impact uh, on um, people that work in the fishing industry uh, to um, pressure them into making sure that they uh, have decent working conditions on board their fishing vessels. I'll stop right here. Um, I want to thank you for uh, having me briefly. And uh, I, uh, I want to leave uh, the space for Alex and Alison and, and Doro and Barrett to continue the conversation.